Good morning. Welcome to this week's View on Africa with a focus on the situation in Burundi and on the recent East African Community Summit, uh, which also addressed the uh, tensions in that country. Um, my name is Stephanie Walters. I'm the head of the Peace and Security Research Program. And I'll be speaking for about 15 minutes and then we'll take your questions both from those guests who are in the room as well as from those who are online. So thank you for joining us this morning. Um, the, the, the impetus for today's talk is the East African Community Summit that, we that the East African Community held last week, um, where Burundi was on the agenda. But before I come to that, I wanted to just do a quick review of some of the other international developments around the Burundi crisis uh, in the last four months. And so really I'll start with the African Union Summit, which was, um, well, actually, sorry, I'll start with the East African Community Talks. Um, the second round of which was held in July in Arusha under the facilitation of Benjamin Nkapa, former Tanzanian president who's assisting Ugandan president Yoweri Museveni. Uh, the uh, initial round of East African community sponsored talks had taken place in May. Uh, the second round was slightly more successful than the first in that um, some of the, uh, so many of the pr key protagonists were able to be there. There had been a sticking point in particular with the opposition grouping, the Sinared, um, which had originally insisted that it be invited as a body and not um, on the basis of individuals who are members and leaders of parties who are members of the Sinared. And that is why um, things didn't work out essentially at the first talks in May. In July, we did have representatives of the Sinared who had agreed to attend um, in their individual capacity. This was really a concession that was made to the Burundian government and something that Mkapa had, had pleaded with the Sinared to, to do when he visited representatives in Brussels in June. So they were present at the East African Community Talks, as was the Burundian government. But in the end, the Burundian government um, simply wasn't happy with the presence of a number of individuals that it, it alleges were involved in the May 2015 coup. And so ultimately, there wasn't really much progress made. Um, there was no um, closing ceremony. Um, because of these, these, these divergences of view over who should be at the negotiating table and nothing really substantive was achieved, nor was there another date set for a resumption of talks. So it was really a disappointing outcome. Um, the East African Community Talks continue to be the main forum for discussion between the opposition and the um, Burundian government. And it continues to be, the, the emphasis continues to be placed on that as the, the primary way to finding a sustainable solution to the crisis in Burundi. So the outcome of the July talks was certainly a disappointment. Mkapa had been expected to go straight from those talks to the African Union Summit, which was held in Kigali, um, but because, and to present their report on a progress report on the East African Community Talks, because there was no substantive progress made, he didn't do that. Burundi had also been planning, the government of Burundi had also been planning on attending the AU summit, but it um, ultimately chose to withdraw for two reasons. One, it felt that the African Union hadn't yet taken um, sufficient consideration of its accusations that Rwanda was, is sponsoring um, its armed opposition, so armed groups in, that are fighting against the Burundian government. And the second was more of a security concern given the poor relationship between the Rwandan government and the Burundian government. The Burundian government had made a request for special security at the AU summit, um, which was essentially turned down. So really uh, disappointing um, showing um, at the, the AU summit. Burundi wasn't high on the agenda. There were of course other crises with which it was competing, notably South Sudan. Um, but I think it was very disappointing that the Burundian government didn't come um, uh, and, and didn't represent those views uh, in the setting of the African Union. Um, and I think it's another blow to the relationship between that institution and the Burundian government, uh, which is unfortunate because it's a relationship that has already deteriorated um, really since the, uh, the Peace and Security Council took bold measures in December to, to try and uh, to, to moot the idea of the deployment of 5,000 um, AU troops to Burundi. And since then, that relationship between the institution and Burundian government has really um, had taken a serious knock. Um, now, the AU, sorry, the Burundian government um, having really sidelined um, the, the African Union with regards to, to its role in Burundi at the January summit um, has been much more engaged with the United Nations. Um, 
whether that engagement was necessarily sincere or not, um, we, we can we can discuss further at another point. But it certainly opened the door to the United Nations much after having closed the door quite decidedly on the AU, um, and really was kind of courting the idea that it would co cooperate with some sort of UN presence, enhanced UN presence, security presence on the ground. Now it's taken a very long time for the UN to to take a uh, decision. First of all, on what type of force it was going to propose for Burundi, and also to finally then table that at the Security Council. This was done in July, um, and what was tabled was the and what was approved was the deployment of 228 UN police officers to Burundi, uh, with a mandate essentially to try and stabilize the situation, but also to provide security to African Union um, human rights observers who were on the ground. Um, I think that for many of us who follow Burundi, um, we, we, we were happy to see that the Security Council could agree on something, although the key objectors, Egypt, China, and Angola, abstained. They had been uh, standing in the way of, of that resolution for some time and also have been standing in the way of a, of a greater uh, deployment. Um, but I think that there is a consensus that 228 police officers is just too far, far too little to make any kind of substantive impact in Burundi at this point. Um, I won't go too much into the human rights situation. Perhaps, we, again, we can discuss that during the question and answer period. But the situation hasn't improved in any substantive way. Um, and, and there's really a new status quo in Burundi where human rights violations, harassment, uh, et cetera, are, are commonplace. Um, and impunity has really taken hold. And there's an absence of rule of law. So. 228 policemen is not nothing in that context. It's important. I, I want to emphasize that, but it's not enough. In the end, the Burundian government didn't accept that. And I think it's um, it's unfortunate uh, because it's 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 just another door that it's closed on on some kind, any kind of constructive, I think, engagement with, with the international community. Um, of course, there's more, 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 there will be more discussions on that, but for now, um, there's really no movement on, on, on the deployment of, the, of, those, of those police officers. And that's then followed by the East African Community Summit, which was held last week in Arusha, where South Africa sent, uh, sorry, not South Africa, the Burundian government sent its foreign minister, Nkurunziza did not attend. It was attended at heads of state level by all the other parties. Um, and uh, the, the key event for Burundi there was that uh, Benjamin Mkapa, the facilitator, presented his report, which I think um, in the scheme of these types of facilitations was really quite candid. Um, so I'll just quickly summarize some of those issues. Um, essentially what, what the facilitator said is that he's had great trouble getting the different parties to the table. He didn't single anybody out. Um, he did note the, the objection of the government to, in particular, Sinared attending as a body. Um, and he has essentially said that he notes that there's great reluctance by all parties to participate in the dialogue. Um, and he's, he's listed about eight points, key points of divergence um, between the, the protagonists, if you will, the government and, and the political opposition. The first one is the status and the implementation of the Arusha Accords. Um, where some believe very strongly that the Arusha Accords must remain a guiding document for the political uh, system in Burundi, while others feel that the Arusha Accords were brokered by outsiders and that they don't really reflect the will of Burundians and that therefore the constitution should rather take primacy over the Arusha Accords. And of course, just to, to clarify, it's the opposition essentially that feels the Arusha Accords must be maintained and the international community feels that as well while the government is, is, is uh, very much in favor of reviewing the Arusha Accords. <laughs> the other question, not surprisingly, is the legality and constitutionality of the third term. The government argues that the ter third term issue is done and over with. It's been resolved. The constitutional court ruling in uh, May 2015 put paid to any uncertainty there. The opposition doesn't feel the same way. Um, then there is the issue of the politicization of the security organs of the state, so the police, the intelligence, and the security services. Um, largely the opposition, civil society, and, and media in exile feel that, that the, um, 
the security agents have been politicized, that they're no longer acting in the national interest of the population, and uh, that they are working essentially at the behest of the, uh, the um, Burundian government, which of course is not a view that's held by the Burundian government itself. Likewise, um, there's divergence of views over the political space for the opposi opposition and its ability to exercise its right to uh, participate in democracy in Burundi. The political opposition, much of which is in exile, does not feel that that space exists, the government does. I think that on this issue, uh, there are many neutral observers and reports that we have seen that uh, would certainly uh, support the opposition view that there is no political space in Burundi. Um, the economy is another, is the fifth point uh, of divergence. Um, the government of Burundi, in spite of having lost almost 50% of its budgetary support as a result of EU sanctions and the withdrawal of aid from key countries, the Dutch, the, the Belgians, the Germans, etc., um, the government is arguing that the economy is fine. Uh, in 2015, I should just add that the economy contracted by 4.7%, whereas it had been experiencing strong regular growth of around 4% in previous years. Um, and this is important for Burundi because it's, a, it's, it's really a, a, a country that's ranked very much at the bottom of, uh, of, of countries in terms of its economic performance. So there is not a lot of elasticity in that economy. So the government's still not willing to acknowledge that um, the, the sanctions are having a negative impact. Um, although it, it, it will say that it, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, a complicated one because the government doesn't want to acknowledge that it's running out of money, but at the same time what it will say is that the sanctions are hurting Burundians. Um, so it's sort of that, that type of, uh, of view that the government puts forward. Point six is relations between Burundi and Rwanda. Um, again, the government view there is that Rwanda is stoking violence and had intended to do so from the very start of the crisis, while the opposing view tends to be the crisis was sparked by the third term issue and there is now a regional aspect to it which has come into play because Rwanda is home to many of the political exiles and because there have been allegations of Rwanda's support to the rebel groups. Um, human rights and humanitarian concerns. Um, Again, split down the, the, same, the same lines. Government says we don't have a problem with human rights violations. They're minimal. Opposition doesn't agree. And then finally, the point of, the, of security, just how safe are people in Burundi? Uh, the government will argue that um, there is no real problem. Incidents of human rights violations uh, are isolated. The security forces are not engaging in uh, harassment or attacks of the, of the uh, of the political opposition, while the political opposition says, you know, it's impossible to express a view, and pe people generally just aren't safe. So those are the those are the points that have been outlined by Mkapa. I think a, f a pretty good comprehensive overview of the divergences between the the main players. So I think um, that it's a good report in that sense. He's made a number of recommendations. Um, and he's also made a number of observations um, that there's a tendency of denial of the crisis by the government and the allied parties. Um, and there's a tendency by de of denial by the opposition groups that there's any kind of legitimacy to the Burundian government. Um, so really he's just talking about the polarizing uh, factors in, in, in the political landscape in Burundi at the moment. Um, in terms of some of the, the recommendations that he's made, um, I mean, he's, he's emphasizing that it's important that the players come back to the table soon, which I think is a very good thing. We lost a lot of time when, when before Mkapa was appointed and when Museveni himself was also, of course, um, taken up with elections in his own country. Um, it, it, it's good that then Mkapa sees that the more time goes by, uh, the more risk there is that the parties will, will simply not ever agree on anything and that there'll just be a settling in of, a, of instability in Burundi. Um, he's appealed for the international partners to continue to support the EAC and he appealed to the EAC also to um, uh, free up some financing for that, for that process. There have been some uh, reports about the fact that the East African community has been very slow to both support the talks logistically but also financially and of course there are other partners as well. China is a key partner, EU is the key partner in financing the EAC talks. Um, but at the uh, summit did endorse all of the recommendations by MKAPA, so there's a sign that there's a commitment to the to the to, to the uh, to the ongoing process. But I think that on a disappointing side, its language has been quite neutral. Um, 
it's really keeping the conversation about Burundi at the level of MKAPA and not engaging much more as a, as a body. Um, there is much more that the East African community could do. Um, perhaps it's doing that behind the scenes. There's a, usually a, a tendency to prefer to put pressure on heads of state in, in behind the scenes settings rather than to embarrass them by being, uh, being more public. But I do think that the key problem we have at the moment is that we are running out of leverage in Burundi, uh, or we have run out of leverage. And so my argument would be that the one remaining body that has leverage at this stage would be the East African community. Of course, we could see more sanctions imposed on individuals by the UN, um, the AU, uh, sorry, the Americans have already done that, and we could see more bilateral sanctions imposed. My sense with the Burundian government is that they will, they will bat that away with a, a narrative that they have already constructed, which is that certain predictable uh, elements in the international community have taken a disliking and are punishing them for the third term issue. Being, I think, um, sanctioned or in any way criticized um, by a community of peers of the East African community, I think is a much more effective way um, to engage in Kurunziza at this point um, and to try and exert some leverage. Inter more international pressure, I think, will just feed into that narrative and it will isolate the Burundian government much more. And I think that they, they already have taken um, substantial steps away from the international community and have increasingly isolated themselves. So an option for the East African community could be to consider imposing regional sanctions on Burundi. Um, I mean, Burundi can't survive without access to markets and also key routes in, in, in the East African community. So it would, it would be very effective. Although, of course, sanctions, as I mentioned earlier, always have a have an extremely detrimental effect on the population. Um, but I think that that would be one way to, to perhaps increase leverage. And there is um, a time issue, as I mentioned, and I'll, I'll, I'll end, I'm winding my way towards the end here. Um, because parallel to the East African community process of, of mediating the, the conflict, there is the inter-Burundian dialogue that is taking place in Burundi itself. I've mentioned in past briefings that it's essentially a politicized, staged, managed, um, negotiation or discussion process that the Burundian government has initiated and is very much guiding. The political uh, participation is by the few remaining um, political opposition members who are still in Burundi and their credibility is very much in question. Um, the, the way that the government is going about it is there is a committee that is leading this, but there is also the semblance, and I, I, I say semblance because I, I'm, I haven't seen any reports that give it much credibility, of popular participation in that it's, it's moving around the country and, and soliciting views on key issues from the population. Um, of course, that's very difficult to verify how, how, how open those views are, how freely people feel that they can dissent in that kind of a setting, remembering that the Mbonera Kure are spread all over the country, that's the CNDD's um, youth militia, and that there's a widespread presence of, of, of security forces. So how freely and fairly are people able to speak? I think that's an important question. Um, the Inter-Burundian Dialogue gave its first report uh, on the 24th of August at which it made two key preliminary recommendations. One, that there be no term limits for presidents in Burundi. And the second, that the constitution, again, should take primacy over the Arusha Accords. Now, while these are no, no surprise, um, because we know that these are agenda points that are important to the government, um, I think they are very worrisome, because if this process continues in a domestic setting, um, and gets legitimacy through parliament, ultimately, then we have another kind of obstacle to, to trying to, 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 to get the government to engage with a more open um, political system, bringing back in um, the real opposition and so on. It's really kind of the, the last nail in the coffin, if you will, of the old Burundi. Um, if we move forward with these, if these recommendations are adopted at a national level. So that, that's where the that's where the urgency is. Um, and, and, and associated with that is that if that does happen, it's just gonna polarize the situation even further because the, the, there is no way that civil society or the political opposition will accept that, 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 that outcome. Um, and so I just wanted to, one last point, um, say that, um, you know, there was, there's a good paper written by someone named Gervais Rufikiri, who um, was himself a very senior member of the CNDD for a very long time, 
um, and is now in opposition or in exile, I should say. And he's made a he's made an interesting done an interesting analysis of the evolution of the CNDD, and talked about you know how in many ways it very begrudgingly accepted Arusha. Of course, it didn't sign Arusha. It came to the party in 2003 and signed. Uh, the ceasefire agreement, and so it's always had uh, doubts and and uh, objections to the the importance of Arusha, um, but that it, it really only engaged with outside actors as much as it had to um, as a ruling party, uh, and that it's it's moved into a new era where it's kind of consolidated its total victory, if you will, so its total control over the country, um, and I think that it it. It is interesting to look at it that way because of this, the way in which the government has positioned itself, in other words, as a victim of an unfair attack on it, um, that, that the reaction of the international community has been disproportionate, um, that other countries that have changed mandate limits haven't had quite as much attention paid to them. And I think it's just something to keep in mind, again, when we look for this leverage, where, how do we get, how do we manage to make the right policy decisions and the right policy interventions in in this situation where we're trying to get the government to soften its stance a little bit and to compromise, it's now very much I think still in the in the on, on its stance right now is no compromise is necessary and we're not interested and I think um, we need to figure out new ways to try and engage um, with, with with the party. It's, it's difficult to say at this point what South Africa could do. Um, I think one of the things South Africa should start with is perhaps to not accept so wholeheartedly the US, the government propaganda and parrot it. I mean, I've heard in a lot of settings now, and I, I, I know these are strong words, but in a lot of settings, the uh, people repeating what Nkurunziza likes to tell people, which is that the rural areas are absolutely at peace with this, with, with, with the current situation, and that it's really only urban areas where there has been opposition to Nkurunziza and his third term. Um, I think that it's extremely difficult for us to make that assessment. We, we had a seminar here a few weeks ago where we had a Burundian colleague who strenuously objects to this uh, um, black and white picture, um, having experienced you know, a variety of different um, uh, scenarios, especially in rural areas where people, it's not necessarily about Nkurunziza or not, or CNDD, FDD or not, it's about instability or not. Um, and so there is a, it, it, I think that the South African government needs to go beyond and deepen its analysis and be willing to look at, you know, all sides of the equation and not necessarily side with Nkurunziza in the, in the way I, I, would, I would argue they have which is very much to kind of just repeat the propaganda that we often hear from government officials. Um, and I think as well, you know, this isn't about um, the third term issue. I think the international community moved on from that quite quickly. And I think the big surprise was that Nkurunziza having won the election um, and then having kind of been given to understand that nobody was going to question that election again. The international community wasn't coming in and saying, we want to have another election or you're not legitimate. The international community was saying, in the AU, everybody was saying, look, we need to do something about the instability. You need to allow the media to function again. You need to allow civil society to operate. You need to allow the political opposition to live and express itself peacefully. Re-establish rule of law and, and, and political space in your country. And instead of that happening, um, the government clamped down further. So I think that, you know, that's where that's where the conversation is at this point. Uh, it's the opposition may may continue to insist that the legit that the elections in 2015 weren't weren't credible and that there should be new ones. And that's for the Burundian parties, I think, to to figure out. And that's why we have the EAC led talks. But South Africa can speak, I think, very clearly on what the current situation is in in Burundi. And I mean, we have you know the the UN. Um, independent investigative panel on Burundi, where there is also a South African representative, uh, recently tabled its its report to uh, at Geneva uh, for the Security Council as well, looking at the human rights violations. Um, you know, and it, again, I mean, it's important to note that they're not all being committed only by government security forces. There are also human rights violations that are committed by the opposition. And the plea there is that, you know, obviously you you get the security forces to desist from acting in that way, but also for just the presence of more human rights observers on the ground. 
And so where South Africa, I think, again, could play an important role is in a, it, two, two, two elements. One, in getting the African, getting Burundi to allow the deployment of, the full deployment of AU human rights observers and AU military observers. And the status there is that I think it's 47 human rights observers and something like 36 military observers are on the ground of a total of 100 each that were originally planned for. The MOU still hasn't been signed between the government and Burundi because Burundi, Burundi's government wants to see the reports before they're sent back to Addis. You know, this is a this is something where South Africa should be lobbying Nkurunziza to, to, to agree. And likewise with the deployment of the UN troops. So, so some really practical, um, I think, steps that can be taken around human rights, more, more human rights observers, more neutral observers on the ground without necessarily having to go full guns blazing and criticizing Nkurunziza. They're not the same thing. The Nkurunziza government may perceive it as the same thing, and that's obviously the problem, right? Um, but they're not the same thing. And I think that's the conversation and the kind of language that one should try to focus on. What was the numbers of observers you mentioned? It was 47 military observers and 36, um, 36 sorry, 47 human rights observers and 36 military observers. I can, I can get you those figures, but it's, in any case, nowhere near the 100, the full 100. Um, yeah, and I, I think that also we need to um, get more clarity on things like, you know, there have been lots of reports about mass graves. Um, there's been talk about trying to send in drones to find those graves. Um, we need more information about what, what exactly is going on with that. Um, and I think also more access to the rural areas for precisely this reason. You know, we don't know how intimidated people there are these are populations that have much less access to internet, to telephones. You know, I mean, people have cell phones, but it, it's it's also not a population that has that, that has a lot of um, disposable income. So we, we just need more information and more neutral presence on the ground. Um, the other thing, and I mean, this is wouldn't be just South Africa's role, of course, but I think is that's really important um, would be to clarify the role of international regional actors. So. What exactly is going on with Rwanda? To what extent is that really, you know, how many rebels are being trained? How much support are they, get, are they getting from Rwanda? And by the same token, um, are there inter Ahamwe that have been in integrated into the Burundian armed forces? I mean, we've heard that a lot and we've been hearing it since the very beginning of this conflict. And it's, a, it's not at all, I mean, when you, if you speak to people in, in Bujumbura, it's sort of a, an un it's an accepted truth that this is the case, but because of the security environment and the clampdown, it's very difficult to establish that factually. And so on both sides, we hear these, these allegations being thrown around, very, very serious allegations that have a tremendous regional impact. Um, and we just need to get to, to the bottom of them, I think. So, you know, if we could have a UN investigation into those two sides where, you know, really, also from the perspective of not of trying not to alienate Nkurunziza further, but also to 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 really get more insight on these key dynamics, I think that would be would be helpful as well. We could speculate why it would want to do that, and, and that's really all we can do. I mean, it, it doesn't need to be economically, I think it makes sense for it to be in the East African community. It's not going to be able to leapfrog its neighbors to create economic links further south. Um, its economic links are, you know, with its neighbors. I think that it's a political decision uh, with regards to, you know, this is a this is a group of countries that might be have, have views that are less threatening to the governments. Um, we know that Angola has been very uh, supportive of the Burundian government. Tanzania, up until recently, I think that's changing. Um, and, and then there, you know, South Africa is seen as a friend, um, and 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 I think it's just it's it's what countries do when they're looking for kind of a a, a friendly group of people to uh, either get more involved or make sure that nobody else gets involved. Um, so I don't think of it as as a. I don't know. I mean, I don't think of it as necessarily what I mean. Burundi doesn't need membership in SADC. For any, for any particular reason at this point in time, other than that it would want to, you know, be part of a group of people or countries rather that are, that are more closely aligned with its own political interests. 
Um, I think it knows that in the EAC, it doesn't play a strategic role economically at all. It's the weakest country by far. Um, and that, you know, much as it may have had important allies in Tanzania, things have changed there. And Rwanda is economically stronger and therefore has more sway on that front. And that often then changes the political calculation of member states. Um, Burundi was already on the outs with um, with Tanzania, the co you know the coalition of the willing, which was Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, in the East African community, much more kind of a a keeping Tanzania and Burundi out of the conversation about key developments. Tanzania is obviously trying, I think, to to reintegrate that group, knowing that its economy is 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 dependent on that. Um, and Burundi is really not, a, it's just not, it can't throw its weight around because it doesn't have enough weight in the EAC. Um, so I, I would, I would, I, I would say that that's one of the reasons they're looking to SADC. <laughs> well, I mean, Burundi closed its border with Rwanda a few weeks ago, and that's been a big problem because it's, it's basically a lot of small time traders, you know, who make their living doing this. The EAC is not happy about it because it's it's basically you're not allowed to do that in the East African community. So in addition to the very subjective accusations that are thrown around between the two countries, it's now become a technical issue within the East African community. The tensions between those two countries, I don't think are going to subside at all um, for for now um, because the rhetoric hasn't 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 changed. Um, and we just don't have enough substantial information. Um, and I think that Rwanda is playing power politics. It's, it's you know, making new friends, like, for example, with Magufuli in Tanzania. Um, it's trying to isolate Burundi uh, in the EAC. And it's, I think, start, gotten off to a, de a decent start there. Um, you know, I mean, some have argued that, that the re one of the, one of the, that Rwanda was kind of neutral towards Burundi. It was it was okay with the you know the the the, the different ethnic uh, leadership and so on, um, and that it was the withdrawal or the loss of the M23 as its kind of force in eastern DRC and its buffer area that really led it to change its game geopolitically, um, and and so that the crisis was almost a, a welcome thing, um, and that it kind of fed into how 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 Rwanda was re interpreting the politics of the region without the M23 at its kind of behest. Um, and I think that makes, makes some sense. Um, and I, I mean, again, you know, with Rwanda, there's always, I would say, a bit of the, the fear that is, I think, very real and, and, and tangible about a threat, you know, a Hutu threat from, uh, an armed Hutu threat from, from anywhere in the region. But I think that the, it's a bigger game. Thank you very much. Thank you to our online audience for attending. Um, next week's View on Africa is on maritime security. Our colleague Tim Walker will be doing that. And as always, thank you for participating and we look forward to having you again.